Hi again, it's Matt, and we're back now looking at um, a couple of examples and talking a little bit about the challenges of uh, modeling and analyzing networks and why there's actually something interesting in the course to talk about. So, in terms of outline, the part we're, we're basically in the first part of the course, so we're looking at background and fundamentals, definitions and characteristics, and um, what I'm going to do is start with a couple of examples, and the idea here is, is to give you some idea of feeling for data, um, view of applications and previewing the kinds of questions we're looking at. And, you know, the word network is a very broad one. It covers a lot of different possible applications. And the kinds of things that we're really going to be looking at are ones where we have some sort of uh, decision-making. People are, are going to tend to be the nodes. So things like uh, phone networks, email networks, um, marriages, uh, um, friendships, co-authorships, collaborations, different kinds of relationships between different individuals. And often we'll be taking the nodes as single people making decisions, but often sometimes we'll look at organizations and other kinds of things, so maybe countries or uh, firms uh, and so forth. So just to fix ideas, um, let me start with uh, an example that comes out of, of a paper by Paget and Ansel, which is based on data that was originally uh, uh, collected by Kent. And here what I'll do in, in terms of references is I'll standardly just give you the names of the authors in, in a year and um, there'll be bibliographic information that you can find um, uh, which a full bibliography of the course which has a list of the, the uh, places where you can find every um, thing that I refer to in the course. And so here <clears throat> what they were looking at is interrelationships between the 16 major families in Florence in the 1430s so this was uh, Renaissance Italy. And these different families in this particular picture that you're looking at uh, are a, a, a tie between two families. Um, here is uh, indicating that there's a marriage between two families. So, um, you know, for instance, this tie right here is a marriage between the Ridolfis and the Medici. And the important aspect of what's going on in this picture is that there are a series of different families. The uh, period before 1430s was one where there was basically an oligarchy. So there were many different families that were powerful. And at this point in time, the Medici rose to power. And in particular, the numbers here that we're going to talk about later in the course are indicating how central these different families are in terms of how many paths between other families in the network pass between a given family. So for instance, if the Rodolfis and the Salvi uh, Salviatis uh, want to get together in this network, they have to pass through the Medici. So the Medici lie on a path, the shortest path, between the Rodolfis and the Salviatis. So in this particular situation, what does the 52% uh, indicate? It indicates that when you look at two families in the network and you look at a shortest path between them, 52% of the time when you're looking at different shortest paths, the Medici lie between them. And that gives you an idea that the Medici were in some sense very central here. And the Medici rose to power. They became the ruling family essentially of Florence during this time period. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, analysis in, in Paget and Ansel's paper that you can read about. But the basic idea from looking at the network analysis is, is understanding that they were more central gives us an idea of why they might have rose to power even though they were not the, the wealthiest at the time or the most politically connected at that time period. So we're, we're dealing with a situation where there's a network which helps us understand what was going on uh, socially. Um, the next uh, slide here, situations where we have countries as the nodes instead of individuals. So these are European countries. Um, we've got Germany, France, Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. So six of the major uh, countries in, in Europe. And in particular, now we've got a weighted and directed network um, indicating how much of a country's debt, national debt, sovereign debt, is held by entities inside another country. So for instance, 18% um, of French national debt is held in Germany. 
13% of Germans' debt is held in France by entities in France. Um, what does this network do for us? It helps us understand how shocks in one country can propagate to uh, affect another. So when we look at some of our models of contagion and diffusion and so forth, what we'll do is we'll analyze networks which will be very helpful in analyzing how this works. So this is from a recent paper I've been doing with um, Matt Elliott and Ben Golub in understanding the transmission of financial shocks and uh, crises in one country and how they might uh, lead to uh, devaluation or, or problems in another country. So some sort of uh, transmission of uh, financial stress. So these are two examples that give us an idea of, of uh, things that um, are elucid illuminated by looking at network data. And the kinds of things you know, that, that we'll be studying in the course are going to take advantage of, of building models of networks so that then we can understand these interactions. And um, what we know about networks is that they're critical in many settings, job context, crime, risk sharing, trade, and politics. Um, there's a rich sociology literature which shows that network structure does impact behavior. Um, and as we just saw, the Medici's were not necessarily the wealthiest or the strongest politically, but they were the most central in a well-defined sense. And one of the things we're going to start with here is that there will be something systematic we can say about networks. And um, in particular, um, when we you know, start thinking about the importance of networks, the fact that uh, these specific relationships are going to matter means that we have to be able to talk about what's the shape of a network. Can we say something systematic about um, how networks are shaped and how the shape transmits into behavior? Um, so what do we know about networks? We know many things. Um, and in particular, networks are important in a variety of different settings, from how people hear about jobs, uh, finding uh, information about employment, to crime, to risk sharing. So uh, if I have a problem and I'm out, out of work for a while, can I borrow money from friends? Can I get help from friends? Um, how does trade occur? Uh, understanding political alliances and uh, behavior and, and legislatures, a whole series of things. And there's a very rich sociology literature which makes clear how some of these things matter. And as we just saw, the Medici's were not necessarily the wealthiest or strongest, but looking at networks can help us understand something about why they might have been uh, able to take advantage of position to advance themselves. Um, understanding uh, characteristics in networks going to be very important, so we'll be looking at things like the uh, path lengths um, and local properties of networks, small worlds, what's known as small worlds, degree distributions, so how, how skewed is a network? Are there people who have lots of connections and other people have few, or does everybody typically have the same number of connections? Those kinds of things are going to matter. Now, in understanding things, it's going to be important that we embed whatever the behaviors are inside a network. So when, if we want to understand how markets work, we'll have to understand something about what the, the different links represent in a network. Um, so specific relationships are going to matter. How do they matter? What's the process by which um, people make trades and so forth? Um, just in terms of, of giving ba basic motivation and background, one thing we can say is that we, there's a number of settings where we know that networks play an important role. And one of the classic uh, areas that's been studied quite extensively is the role of networks in labor markets, and in particular, how, fe how people end up finding out about jobs. So some of the early work in this area, Myers and Schultz looked at, uh, that what they did is they surveyed a, a series of textile workers in the um, late 1940s, so the paper is published in 1951. And what they found was that, uh, you know, asking people, how did you find out about your job? Actually, 62% found out about their first job in, in the textile industry from somebody already there. So they had a contact who was in the textile industry. That was what got them in there. Um, only 23%, in contrast, found by their, their job just by applying uh, directly. 15% um, by agencies and ads and so forth. So you can see that the, the actual network of contacts was a, a, a very important player in how people were finding out about jobs in the textile industry. 
Um, later studies, uh, Reason Schultz, for instance, 1970s, another classic, what they did is they went around and interviewed people in different areas, uh, different professions, and they found that it wasn't simply textile workers that were finding their jobs through contact networks. Um, typists don't really exist anymore, but at the time, uh, if you wanted something uh, typed up, you had a typist. 37% of those people were finding their jobs through, through contacts. Um, accountants, 23.5. Material handlers, 73.8. Janitors, 65. Electricians, 57. So there was a range, you know, ranging from 20 to, to 80% roughly, but overall, uh, word of mouth and being connected to individuals was an important way of finding jobs in, in no matter what profession you were in. There's been a whole series of other studies. Um, Granovetter's uh, work on this is, is quite influential. Um, there's a nice uh, survey of this literature by Unitas and, and Lowry um, in, in 2004. And when we begin to look at, at this, it's not just that networks are important in labor markets, but we see that uh, networks have played a role in, in a series of other settings as well. So just to mention a few to keep a, this in our, in our minds as we go through the course, um, uh, networks have been looked at in, in criminal settings, so two-thirds of criminals actually commit crimes together with others, so they're, they're not acting alone. Um, there's evidence that social interactions play important uh, uh, it, it, roles in determining who be becomes a criminal in a youth uh, and has uh, delinquency rates. Um, in markets, uh, there's a whole series of, uh, of studies that have looked at things like um, how people make con business contacts, who you end up working with, who you end up contracting with. Um, Brian Newsy has a nice paper looking at uh, you know, how the importance of, of specific contracts in the garment industry, so who ends up uh, producing a garment for which designer. Um, there are things like, uh, you know, uh, repeated interactions in, in fish markets can, uh, can be represented as network structures, um, social insurance, risk sharing. Um, when we look at diffusion, there are going to be important roles here, so understanding uh, which farmers end up taking up hybrid corn at which point in time, which uh, doctors end up prescribing certain drugs at different time. So there'll be a whole series of different things, and, and the, the range here is going to be quite extraordinary. Okay, so the main challenge we're going to face in the course is the complexity of networks. And what do I mean by the complexity? So let's do a very simple calculation. So imagine that you have just 30 nodes, so a fairly small society, 30 individuals, say a classroom in a, in a, a school. Um, and we ask how many different possible networks could there exist that represent the friendships in that classroom? Well, it could be that it's an empty network. Nobody's friends with anybody. It could be that it's a complete network. Everybody's friends with everybody else. Um, the number of possible networks in that classroom is actually enormously large. So person one could have 29 different friendships, right? They could be friends with person two, three, four, five, what, up through 30. Um, person two could have 28 friendships, not counting person one, and so forth. So if we ask how many, what are the number of different friendships that could be either present or not present in that classroom, when you total all those numbers up, that's um, uh, 435 in total. So that's 30 choose 2 in, in terms of the combinatorics, um, 435 different possible friendships of pairs of individuals who could be friends with each other. So that's 435 possible links that could be either present or not. And when we look at 435 uh, friendships, we've got two to the 435 possible networks that could be there. So each one of those links could either be present or not. Two to the 435, well, 435 doesn't sound like that big a number, but two raised to the 435th power is an enormous number. So the estimates of, of how many atoms in the universe there are, somewhere between two to the 158th and two to the 246th. So if we look just at one network in one classroom, we've got more possible networks <clears throat> than there are atoms in the universe by, by orders of magnitude. So there's no possible way that we can just describe networks by saying, you know, it's, it's network number 53. Um, we're going to have to find ways of describing these networks that are going to ca ca capture the basic properties of the network in a very succinct and, and simple way so that we don't have to, to just go through a giant catalog of, of different possible set uh, networks that are out there. It's simply um, overwhelming. So the, the main part of the, 
uh, challenge that we're going to have to deal with first is just representing networks and thinking about how do we capture this complexity in a way that makes sense. And so that's going to be um, the beginning of, of, of our definitions. How do we represent networks? How do we capture them?